exercise in general is usually going to be beneficial for long-term health. But what types of exercise are best for health? And what is the best way to train to maximize health and longevity? First, we need to define what exactly health means. Well, according to the World Health Organization, health can be defined as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So with this extremely broad definition and multifactorial nature of health, it is difficult to pinpoint exactly what outcomes we are trying to achieve. Rather, there seem to be many different categories which can promote health. So we will cover six primary areas which exercise can be used to improve and can therefore promote health via. These are general physical activity, cardiorespiratory fitness, muscle mass and strength, bone density, mobility and flexibility, and socialization. First, let's discuss general physical activity. General physical activity refers to your total daily activity levels, accounting for all forms of movement and exercise. This includes everything from competitive sport, lifting in the gym, walking around the supermarket, to gardening. While there is no perfect metric used to quantify physical activity levels, the most convenient and practical method is to use step counts. Steps account for most forms of physical activity and does a good enough job at representing activity levels for most people. In terms of health outcomes, multiple meta-analyses confirm that those who have higher step counts have a lower mortality risk than less active individuals. For example, this meta-analysis looked at the association between step counts and mortality risk. It was found that higher daily step counts were associated with a lower all-cause mortality risk. The majority of benefits are observed when accumulating up to around 10,000 steps per day, with small additional benefits going beyond this up to 20,000 per day. For some practical guidelines, people should aim to accumulate at least 5,000 steps per day as a minimum for general health purposes. And ideally, we would want to try and accumulate more than 10,000 per day if possible. There may be small additional benefits to achieving over 15,000 per day, but this may not be realistic to achieve for everyone. And these steps can be achieved in many different ways. It can be through intentional exercise, like sport or jogging, or it can be via consequential physical activity, such as walking to do daily chores or as part of your occupation. Or it can be via leisurely activities, such as walking your dog or gardening. Another way in which exercise can be beneficial for health is via improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness. We typically find that improving cardiorespiratory fitness levels has beneficial effects on various health markers. As an overall indicator, higher cardiorespiratory fitness levels are associated with a lower mortality risk. This was seen in this study, which explored the association between cardiorespiratory fitness and mortality risk. It was found that those in the highest fitness category had a four times lower likelihood of all-cause mortality compared with those in the lowest fitness category. So we probably want to achieve at least a moderate level of aerobic fitness for long-term health. Basically any form of exercise will develop some degree of cardiorespiratory fitness, but aerobic exercise is generally going to be the most effective. This includes any activities where the cardiorespiratory system is the main limiter of the exercise, such as running, cycling, swimming, rowing, and so on. And in terms of how much aerobic exercise to perform, this study looked at the association between aerobic exercise and mortality risk. It was found that more aerobic exercise was associated with a reduced all-cause mortality risk up to 8 hours per week but the majority of benefits seem to be achieved with around two to three hours per week with small additional benefits beyond this. So for some practical guidelines, it would be beneficial to perform at least one dedicated aerobic exercise session per week for health outcomes. Two to three sessions per week would likely promote even more favorable health outcomes and four or more sessions might have small additional benefits, but in many cases it may not be feasible. Some other favorable health adaptations that exercise can promote are muscle growth and strength gains. Having low muscle mass relative to body weight seems to be problematic for long-term health. This was seen in this study, which looked at the association between muscle mass of the limbs and mortality risk. It was found that having low muscle mass in the arms and legs was associated with a higher all-cause mortality risk. However, beyond moderate levels of muscle mass, there doesn't seem to be additional benefits to having higher amounts. 
So for health, it seems that it is more about avoiding low muscle mass rather than trying to build the biggest muscles possible. This may be because we simply need to have enough muscle mass to be active and perform functional tasks of daily living throughout our lifespan, especially as we age. In terms of strength, there also seems to be a positive effect of being generally stronger on reducing mortality risk. This was observed in this meta-analysis, which analyzed the influence of general strength on mortality risk. It was found that those with stronger hand grip and knee extension strength had a lower all-cause mortality risk. And in terms of a dose-response relationship, this study explored the association between strength and mortality risk. It was found that a stronger grip strength in older adults was associated with a lower all-cause mortality risk to a fairly meaningful magnitude. This doesn't necessarily mean that how strong we are in the gym at a specific lift is directly related to our health. It just means that being generally stronger is probably going to be beneficial for long-term health, especially as we age. In terms of what this means for practical exercise recommendations, it suggests that performing some resistance training is likely to be beneficial. Resistance training is the most effective method to build muscle and strength, so incorporating some lifting can be helpful to achieve adequate levels. It doesn't seem that large volumes of resistance training are necessary to maximize health outcomes, it is more about having enough muscle mass and strength to be functional. For some practical recommendations, lifting one to three times per week should be sufficient to near maximize health outcomes. Training more than this might have some small additional benefits, but probably nothing major. The next way in which exercise can benefit health is via its effects on bone health. As we grow, our bone mass increases until it reaches a peak around middle age. We then start to see a gradual decline, with women typically experiencing a greater decline due to hormonal changes after menopause. This increases our risk of fractures from falls or other impacts, which can be fatal in the elderly. This study explored the association between bone density and mortality risk. It was found that compared with those with a normal bone density, those with osteopenia, which is slightly lower than normal bone density, had a slightly elevated all-cause mortality risk. Whereas those with osteoporosis, which is significantly lower than normal bone density, had a substantially greater mortality risk. We can use exercise to improve bone density and minimize losses in bone mass throughout our lifespan. Pretty much all forms of exercise are going to have some benefit for bone health. However, exercise that is weight-bearing and high impact tends to be more beneficial for improving bone mass and density. This includes weight-bearing exercise like jogging and high-impact bodyweight exercises like plyometrics. However, non-weight-bearing exercise, such as swimming and cycling, typically isn't as favorable as it doesn't load the skeletal system as much. For example, this study compared the bone characteristics of regular runners versus cyclists. It was found that total bone mass and total bone density was greater in the runners compared with the cyclists. Furthermore, resistance training seems to be especially beneficial for improving bone density. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of 8 months of aerobic versus resistance training on bone density in older women. It was found that hip bone density increased in the group performing resistance training, but no significant change was observed in the group performing aerobic exercise. Although the aerobic exercise was still more effective than the control group who didn't perform any exercise and saw decreases in bone density. So, from a practical perspective, it is important to ensure we are loading our skeletal system during exercise. Although, it is usually something we don't need to specifically focus on if we are already fairly active, because most forms of exercise already do this. But in the unique case that most of your exercise consists of non-weight-bearing activities like swimming, cycling, or kayaking, then it would probably be beneficial to include some weight-bearing exercise or resistance training. Or if you have lower than average bone density and want to specifically focus on improving or limiting further losses, then performing more high impact or resistance training is recommended. Next, let's discuss mobility and flexibility. There is less data on the influence of mobility and flexibility for health, but some evidence finds that it may be important. Similar to the other topics discussed, greater mobility is associated with a reduced mortality risk. This was seen in this study, which looked at the association between overall joint range of motion from 20 different movement tests and survival rates. 
it was found that in both men and women, those with the highest flexibility scores had the lowest mortality risk, while those with the lowest flexibility scores had the highest mortality risk. It should also be noted that this, and much of the previously discussed research, are associations, not necessarily direct causative effects. So it may be that those with lower flexibility scores were those who were already older and in poorer physical condition, and therefore experienced greater mortality rates. Whereas those with higher flexibility scores may have been younger and in better overall physical condition. In any case, this seems to be at least indirectly associated with long-term health outcomes, so it is probably worth addressing to some extent. In order to best train for flexibility and mobility, you may not need to do anything specific. If the other exercise you perform requires you to move through various ranges of motion, you may already be flexible enough for general health and function. In fact, resistance training seems to be just as effective as static stretching for improving flexibility. This was seen in this meta-analysis, which analysed the effects of resistance training on improvements in joint range of motion. Compared with no intervention, resistance training significantly improves range of motion. And when compared to stretching, resistance training seems to produce similar increases in range of motion. So for some practical guidelines, if you were performing other exercise such as resistance training through a full range of motion, then you may not need to perform specific mobility training for those joints. However, if you aren't resistance training or performing other exercise which utilises a large joint range of motion, then it may be beneficial to perform specific mobility training like static stretching. And the last beneficial component of exercise for health is for the socialisation aspect. Independent of the physiological benefits, exercise can promote longevity through social interaction. It seems that maintaining social relationships throughout our lifespan tends to be important for health and longevity. This study looked at the association between social isolation and mortality risk. It was found that in both men and women, those who were categorised as the most socially isolated had the highest all-cause mortality risk, whereas those classified in the two most social categories had the lowest mortality risk. And while social isolation isn't just achieved through exercise, it can be one way to increase our social interaction. In particular, group-based exercise requires communication and generally builds some sort of social relationship. This could include being involved in a team sport, group fitness classes, or just going for a walk with a friend. Taking all this into consideration, what is the best way to train for health and longevity? Well, first and foremost, basically any form of exercise seems to be beneficial for long-term health. Even just being generally physically active by achieving a moderate step count has significant positive effects. And for even better health outcomes, accumulating more than 10,000 steps per day can be additionally beneficial. Beyond being generally active, including some higher intensity aerobic exercise seems to be further beneficial for promoting cardiorespiratory fitness. You don't need to be an elite athlete, just 1-3 to three cardio sessions per week will be sufficient to achieve the majority of health benefits. Furthermore, including some resistance training in your routine also seems to improve health outcomes. Resistance training is going to be effective for muscle growth, strength gains, and increasing and maintaining bone density. It is also highly effective for improving and maintaining joint range of motion. Again, you don't need to become an elite bodybuilder, just 1-3 to three resistance training workouts per week should be sufficient to achieve the majority of health benefits. And if you aren't performing resistance training, and your exercise routine doesn't require your joints to move through the ranges of motion necessary to maintain mobility, then some direct flexibility training may be beneficial. Static or dynamic stretching can be used to increase flexibility through ranges of motion that you may be limited in. Lastly, it may be beneficial to be involved with group-based exercise on a regular basis. This is a way to develop and maintain social relationships for those who may not have much social interaction. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.